but we're gonna watch a little bit of of this and sort of do a, a stop and pause so whenever you have something to say matt let me know um this is from a half an hour uh tirade and there's really no other way to describe this uh than a tirade uh peterson um has always i think we're getting peterson returning uh to the hits a little bit of just being a curmudgeonly old uh reactionary and we'll get into some of the reasons um why here just to set this clip up a little bit um it's about climate change and uh, he's going to make some arguments as to why we can never know these things which is very funny but um Typical. just to set, set people up what i had to cut just for time um he is getting really worked up that deloitte um an institution that i don't think matt oh, and i know myself have a lot of respect or interest in uh, came out with a climate proposal um he also notes that basically this is an attempt to turn eu policies um into international compulsory uh, policies now you all know uh, my position on on brexit i stand with people like nick lynch um, and the labor left and recognizing that the european union is a technocratic institution and there are critiques um significant ones from the left on this um but this is just like peterson i don't know i, I should save some of this for the actual clip but like the thing about peterson that i i really want to know it apart from like his blovating and how funny his voice is and all of that blah 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 is that what he's doing um for whatever reason he has like captured the attention of like a certain group of like young guys out there and that sucks. But what's amazing to me about it is that Peterson really isn't innovating that much. He's he's basically merging two things. Post-structuralism, which is the theory that he critiques constantly, basically acting like there can be no kind of truth ascertained, which is amazing because that's the thing that he like says that he's standing up for. And he mixes it with like these very, very con like not contemporary. Um, old, well-worn arguments um, from the right wing. If it's about institutions like the European Union um, or climate change, like he's not really doing too much innovation, um, our friend in Canada. But I don't know. We should maybe yeah, no. uh, jump into it. Yeah, I mean, I think you're exactly right. Um, was it uh, Matt Huber uh, and Ben Burgess? No. Um I can't, oh, who, I'm, I'm blanking on his name, um, talked about Jordan Peterson. Also, some more news, uh, Cody Johnson did a Jordan Peterson thing too, but yeah, go ahead. So let's jump. So again, he's complaining about Deloitte here, so we're cutting right in the middle of his, his takedown. Are these Deloitte models, which are supposed to guide all the important decisions we make about the economic security and opportunity of families and the structures of our civil societies, accurate enough even to give those who employ them any edge whatsoever, say, in predicting the performance of a stock portfolio, one based on green energy, say, over the upcoming years? The answer is no. Okay, so let's just jump in here for a second. Um, because again, you know, just catching everybody up, what he's reacting to is Deloitte came out with like, you know, a, a plan that economies can sort of follow to reach net zero by 2050. And I'm just going to tell you all right now, without going into the details of the Del Deloitte plan, it's actually not to give Peterson too much credit here. Um, I agree with Peterson in the sense that like, yeah, the Deloitte plan is very bad. Um, and it is technocratic and it is something that I'm against, but what he's doing is he's merging two things, right? He's merging the suspicion that I think most people rightfully have of these kind of, you know, supranational organizations like Deloitte that have a lot of influence. Um, the suspicion that people have of those institutions with, um, the idea of being able to model and understand the potential of, of climate change. So like, look, totally agree. Uh, Deloitte actually has no sense of, I, I have no confidence in Deloitte's ability to actually prescribe solutions to this. Why? It's not because of the impossibility of understanding the circumstances. It's because Deloitte as an institution has one goal and then it's incongruent with actually dealing with climate change. And that one goal is maximizing profit for their corporate clients. So what the Deloitte strategy is to deal with this is basically protect corporate interests and corporate power and the power of millionaires and billionaires, people who like Jordan Peterson likes very much um, at the expense at the rest of us. 
Um, so again, he's 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 doing this move here where he's merging this, the correct suspicion I think people have of institutions with Deloitte and making yeah. it seem as if climate change as it's in itself is sort of cooked up by these fellows um, for them to take control. Newsflash, y'all, they already are in control. It's right. not a new thing that they're using. This is their gambit to take power. They're already there. Yeah, that's exactly the thing. It's like the, the, the problem with Deloitte and these management consultancy firms isn't sort of what they represent, which is what we have, which is how like capital like sort of is tries to like coordinate itself. It's what they're saying and mm -hmm. sort of acknowledging certain realities that certain parts of like capital at this point doesn't want to uh, um, uh, exist. And also, I just meant to say, uh, as to how like frivolous Jordan Peterson is as a, as a thinker, it's uh, Ben Burgess with uh, Matt McManus. Um, uh, but oh. uh, yeah, if we have uh, some more of uh, our, our buddy here, we can. Yeah. Just, the Deloitte shit, it pisses me off when they when they get into like, look at us being the populace. It's like if they were saying like wokeness is a problem, you'd be celebrating them. But like that's not where like see the harder sell these days. And why why some you know dumbass you know self help guru with like okay a decent audience like they should start listening to it. I mean I think it's really pathetic if a CEO would change uh, be persuaded by a guy like this. <laughs> I think so. And I mean I'll, I'll just say we have a lot to get to so don't want to take too long here but um you know like the thing the reason that like Peterson I think is like something that's cuz I I've realized a lot of times people who like consume a lot of political content it's like prepping themselves for like hypothetical or likely debates that they're going to get into with friends and family, et cetera. And the thing is with Peterson, the Deloitte stuff is it's extremely um, salient if you are coming at like the Buttigieg style uh, climate politics, right? Where most Democrat, most members of the mm. Democratic Party are so embedded in this that they couldn't take the position that you and I have at the get go, which is like, yeah, fuck right. those guys. Um, they're going to have to be like, no, you know, we, we like these guys. They're really smart, smart, smart people. Um, yeah, I, they all worked there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. Um, but we'll get right back into this. And um, I'm going to let this play for a, a, a couple seconds just so we can get a, a, another hit. But I wanted to make sure that we do address the other thing that Peterson is, is doing here where he's saying, well, if they know so much, then let's see how what good they can do at predicting the, the stock market. Right. Which is like, this is another really fascinating thing about Peterson is that he is, you know, he claims to sort of come from like a spirituality of Christianity, uh, but truly he is just an ev evangelist of, of capital and capitalism, right? And like, he's treating the stock market as if it is a rational system. Like the stock market is inherently irrational because the stock market, rather than actually being a kind of neutral scientific barometer of what parts of the economy we should be allocating resources to, it is a big pit where a lot of people try to make speculative bets on what they think is going to win and lose. And by the nature of placing those bets affect the stock price. So like, you know, there's a lot of funny things that you can look at um, on this. I highly suggest people read uh, Doug Henwood's um, book, uh, God's end of the new economy. I'm getting it wrong, but Doug Henry did a book, 2002, a really phenomenal, uh, novel, not novel, but, uh, you know, book breaking <laughs> down like wall street, et cetera. And in it, he has this really funny fact, um, where like, you know, all these people who act like the stock market is like this, like height of like rationality explain the fact that stocks tend to do better, um, the day before Christmas break on a Friday when it's sunny out, like all of these factors that are certainly affecting the people who are going to that building and making decisions are yeah. like, you know, fundamentally changing um, what the, what the market is doing. So what he's doing here is he's conflating asset prices and the, uh, the ability to be able to speculate on asset prices with your ability to be able to ascertain like scientific knowledge about the environment, but let's let him go. How do we know? Because if such accurate models existed and were implemented by a company with Deloitte's resources and reach, Deloitte would soon have all the money. That is never going to happen. The global economy, let alone the environment, is simply too complex to model. It is for this reason, fundamentally, that we have and require a free market system. The free market is the best model of the environment we can generate. Let me repeat that with a codicil. 
Not only is the free market the best model of the environment we can generate, it is and will remain the best model that can, in principle, ever be generated with its widely distributed computations, constituting the totality of the choices of 7 billion people. Except, sorry, except they're yeah. not it's widely a, distributed. This is the point I made about, like, earlier, where it's all billionaires and several, few, a few companies. Um, it's getting less and less widely distributed as, as capitalism tends towards monopoly. Um, there are less and less companies that were not around a year ago than there were the year before, and that goes back into the 70s. It's getting worse and worse to do a startup. So mm -hmm. the idea, this is getting less and less distributed. It's, it's fucking Bill Gates owning all the farmland. How is that shit for distributed, right? Mm -hmm. Like it, it, this is all, uh, even on its own terms, uh, fallacious. <laughs> Well, I mean, regarding Kermit, like <laughs> there's, 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 there's like, a, there's two claims here that we have to spend some time on. The first is a philosophical claim. And I wish we had Dr. Ben Burgess here, um, to give us whatever fallacy this is. Um, but in my own kind of homespun way, I'll explain it to folks. He's effectively arguing that unless you can have total complete knowledge, you can have no knowledge, Right which is in itself is just like a huge logical leap, right? If you cannot be able to predict all future events with like, you know, 100% or even 95% accuracy, then you have to throw everything out, which is in a really insane way uh, to live your life versus for something that Peterson as a defender of like Western values, et cetera, um, you know, should be arguing for, not that this is entirely a Western value, et cetera, is like the history of the Enlightenment and the scientific method, right? Which recognizes that total knowledge is impossible. So rather than just saying, well, I guess if I don't know everything, I can know nothing. We say, well, what things can we figure out with a relative degree of, of certainty and probability? And let's use that baseline of, of knowledge to extrapolate out so we can better understand the world. And then as we th see things that come into conflict with maybe some of those base assumptions, we challenge those base assumptions with the new information that we have. Like this is the basis of like rational thinking. Like the basis of, quote unquote, the thing that they like to argue for Western civilization, right? In the best way that they present it. Um, and Peterson is right now, like to promote his reactionary agenda is throwing all of this shit away, right? Which again, like, look, he's a grifter. He's a charlatan. But this is a really notable thing that I think people should hold on to that Jordan Peterson is actually making an irrational argument, um, despite presenting himself as the calm, cool, collected, you know, character. Uh, uh, there's the the second bit on the on the free market. I have more on unless you had anything um, you wanted to add to that. The second bit is what he's talking about. Is this is what I was saying about him being very retro of a thinker? You know, so this is something called the calculation problem, um, and it's it's one of those questions that um, was a a huge question, particularly for socialist economists and socialists in general to try to figure out when comparing the system in the United States and Western Europe with the system in the Soviet Union, right? Where you had centralized planning. And like the Soviet system was very, very successful at providing people with things like foods and daily needs, really bad at producing things like rubber bands and like photo frames and things like that. And the reason for that is because they did not have systems that were advanced enough to really be able to calculate demand for the year. So there were always, there, there was always crises and shortages. And this is a very real uh, question. It's one that social st should take seriously. It's not just a right-wing straw man. But Peterson, again, is speaking with such certainty. Um, he should look at the models that are being practiced in global capitalism today. A uh, friend of the show, uh, guest, um, I know Matt likes this book, has read this book, The People's Republic of Walmart. Uh, Peterson should maybe pick it up because even capitalist firms do not operate in this kind of pure free market system that uh, Jordan Peterson um, is arguing for. In fact, capitalist firms like Walmart, Walmart does not compete with itself. Walmart is a distributor and a seller at the same time. Well, how do they do that? Well, because they have access to such a wealth of information, because they have, you know, created like a semi or close to monopoly system across the United States, they can understand with relative accuracy what products and how many of the products to stock on the shelves. And they don't do that through rampant competition. 
they do that through coordination and central planning. And I highly suggest people read this book uh, by Lee Phillips and uh, Michael uh, Rorsky. I always mispronounce Rorsky. I apologize. Rorsky, um, I think it is. Thanks. <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, Michael. I'm, I'm so bad with stuff like that. But um, um, I highly suggest that you know li our listeners read that book and Peterson pick himself up a copy, though we know Peterson is not somebody who's very interested in reading. Not a reader, no. I mean, questionably literate. Uh, I mean, not much, like everything, I mean, maybe he's not too young, but that could have been some sort of like oral storytelling from a teacher. No, yeah, to be it's, it's, it's Milton Friedman. It's like, that's what I'm like, Peterson mm. read at a certain point in his life, but like he probably stopped reading in like 1976 or something like that, <laughs> 1980, right? Um because all, all of these arguments are extremely retro and like they're not even dominant anymore, even with like pro capitalist right wing economists. So like Peterson, again, this is where like public education actually is important. Like, you know, I always say this about James Lindsay, like James Lindsay has some popularity um, because a lot of people are curious about Marxism, not necessarily because they're interested in it because they like want it to happen, but they're, what is this thing? And l people like Lindsay fill that void for them because our, our school system, our education system doesn't provide any of that information yeah. for people, which allows people like James Lindsay to spout absolute nonsense uh, to a lot of people who are learning it from the first time from a, like an absolute charlatan. And this is what Peterson is doing. He's trying to teach a bunch of young folks, um, about global economics and like, look, you got to, you know, re, you know, watch the Friedman, the, the, what is it? The, that's not the myth, um, whatever it is, whatever thing he put in before the, the, whatever of the pencil, right. Where he just talks about how amazing the pencil is as like a, right, as right. a social, as a construct. Right. And like, yeah. this is like parlor trick kind of like intellectualism. And that's what Peterson does professionally. Um, and again, like these things aren't up to date. They have plenty of criticisms. So yeah, calculation question. A very serious one. Um, but Peterson acting as if that's the system that uh, we've been living under, that's the system that's been providing for people for so long, is absolutely erroneous. Um, and it's incongruent with the actual history, economic history of this fucking country. I'm not even making an ideological statement about which ones I like better than other ones. It's just not even reflective of the, the, the current state of American capitalism or even American capitalism 60s, 70s, and 80s. Yeah. And let's go back, but let's also not forget that he's utilizing these fucking insane arguments to say that we can't accurately recognize that the polar ice caps are melting and that human activity has been causing an increase in greenhouse gases that are warming the planet. <laughs> okay, well, if you know that, what uh, color underwear am I wearing? Right yeah, now? exactly. If I mean, you, it's, you know, it's like an argument. With the, it's like an argument with the four-year-old, frankly. <laughs> cannot be improved upon. Certainly not by presumptuous, power-mad, globalist utopians who think that hiring someone, mysteriously manipulating a few carefully chosen numbers and then reading the summarized output means genuine contact with the reality. And let, let, we'll let him go, but like, let's just be very clear here. This is now Peterson not just making irrational and insane arguments, like conspiratorial arguments, right? This is like actually like you can't trust any information that's given to to you by anyone other than me, um, because people could be lying to you. But also, even as a criticism of Deloitte and saying like they're the ones handing down this stuff, to, that's not a proper analysis of these management consultancies. <laughs> these consultancies are basically telling these managers what they want to hear from a third party so they can go and institute their policy, mm -hmm. right? Like it's basically cover your ass material for CEOs to do what they want to do anyway. And like, yeah, at a certain point, these fuckers were going to have to acknowledge that climate change <laughs> is the thing that actually exists. Um, because you know, actually uh, it's an imperative that capital recognizes the type of planet that um, it's going to be trying to exploit um, in decades. So yes. like, Right. Like, uh, so that's what that's what this complaint is about right now. This idea that the like, delay, what what are they doing this for? Like, right. Like, what's the underlying motivation here? It's lost. It's it's obscured because it, 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 this isn't a critique of capitalism. It's a critique of those degenerate management consultancy people and their what motive? Like, what what are they what are they doing, Jordan? They're already on top. They're already on top. Reality of the future and the generation of knowledge unassailable on both the ethical and the practical front. 
the impact of delusional thinking Why is this a problem? Why should you care? How many takes do you think that took, Matt? Embarrassing, man. And I, I just want to say at the start of this video, he's like, I saw, I, I watched the beginning of this. He's all like, people have criticized my tone and I'm going to, I, I, you know, I, wrath is a, it's a sin. And I'm going to try to be a little bit more like circumspect or blah, blah, blah. Like, first of all, don't show weakness like that, Jordan. <laughs> Looking a little bit better by second guessing yourself on camera. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, let's let's go. He's really giving it the D Pacino. I don't know who is this De Niro lean in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, the saviors at Deloitte admit that there will be a short-term cost to implementing their cure, which is, by the way, net zero emissions by 2050, an utterly preposterous and inexcusable goal, both practically and conceptually. This, by the way, is a goal identical to that adopted last week by the utterly delusional leaders of Australia, who additionally committed that resource-dependent and productive country to a 40% plus decrease by 2005 standards in greenhouse gas emission within the impossible time frame of eight years. This will devastate Australia as the framers of such. <laughs> we could keep it going um, for a lot longer than that, but I'd love to hear from our Australian uh, comrades um, what they think about Peterson there. But I mean, this brings up, um, I mean, I don't know. Did you have any more roasts that you want to throw well, in before we get practical? It's just funny, like, you know, he's trying to stake this position, which uh, I think a lot of people are finding untenable uh, on climate change because there, there's no real consistency with like, well, do you agree that fucking fossil fuels are warming the planet? Like, well, he doesn't. He's trying to not say that because that would make him seem absolutely irrational. That's why he's right, dancing exactly. around this. Like, if you don't know everything, you can't know nothing. Yes. And that's what's so funny about how this dance is happening right now, because uh, Kevin Stitt, governor of uh, Oklahoma, was on Dave Rubin's show uh, the other day, and I subjected myself to it. And uh, it, what's funny about that is, like, simultaneously he'll say, like, you know, these left-wing agenda about climate. And then also he'll be like, we know we need to make this transition, and actually we're very proud of our oil, but we're also very proud of our wind and solar, and they particularly have a lot of wind power. And he touts that, and he's mm. proud of it. He's fucking running on, like, we have both and all of the above energy uh, mm. uh, solution, right? And like that's fucking honestly, that's tough to argue. Like that's the real thing. Like Green New Deal needs to fight against is that all of the above shit because people love that. Um, but 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 the, the, talking out of both sides of their mouth because um, he's simultaneously calling it a left wing agenda, but also you're you're all moving it towards them, and all businesses that are coming to Oklahoma like understand that that um renewable is an asset going into the future like a certain it's a, how we talk about the ft being like um a better source for news because mm -hmm. business can't like put that they can be really fucking um well, wait 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 why did why does business need news when we have the pricing mechanism matt <laughs> yeah that's a good point just look at the prices <laughs> you know? like it, like like it's the matrix <laughs> No, I mean, you know, I mean, again, he's making an irrational, like purely like like textbooks, irrational argument. But I, I, I selected this clip because it gets back to something we've been talking about a lot on, on this program, where it's like, look, the Deloitte plan for dealing with this ship, untenable. We don't want it either because it is yeah. exactly the kind of technocratic like when Peterson says that kind of stuff, I'm with him, you know, Um the people who like hear that and they get motivated with it. I have some things that I can say to them to bring them over, over to our side. And I think that like, we need to be well-versed in this because this is the play that they're making because out of power, when the working class, working class politics are out of power, the people who are going to try to do something on climate are the Bidens, are the, uh, Macrons, um, to lesser extent, the, the Johnsons. We'll see how much longer he's around, you know, none of them impressive, none of them, going anywhere close to what we need to be doing 
Um, and all the while, putting the social costs and the economic costs on the backs of, of working people and working families, right? Which it just goes to show there's never been a time where it is more and more desperate for us to be putting forward a positive vision of, of green transition, Green New Deal, just tr transition. Yeah. Because the liberals aren't going to deliver and the right is going to, it's like, here's another example, um, different context, different um, policy. But think about the difference between Medicare for all and Obamacare, right? Medicare for all is the solution. The right wing, when Obamacare gets put into place, had a field day with it because there were issues with it, particularly um, with the with the tax on people who went uninsured. Um, I'll tell you right now, y'all, like when I was, you know, younger and, and that stuff first went into play, um, it did not make sense for me to buy a marketplace plan, even with all of the subsidies that it came with on when I did like the math of like, here's how much my, my rent is, <laughs> here's how much my wages are. I can't throw in a $600 premium payment each month um, to go to the doctor. I'm relatively healthy, thank God. Um, but also, you know, was making a serious risk where if anything were to happen, I could be absolutely screwed. Right wing loved that that kind of those, those, those holes because they got to make an argument, particularly to people who are in similar working class situations, you know, um, people like me who are working for a living. That like, yeah, look, this is what happens when big government gets in to your life and starts telling you what to do. When the problem was not necessarily that there was a, a government policy regarding healthcare, it was that it was an insanely wonky one that had one goal and one goal alone to um, to mitigate some of the worst aspects of the American free market healthcare program and to maintain the hegemony and power and profits of the insurance industry. You give a field day to the right wing when you do shit like that. And that's exactly yeah. what's coming with climate, um, where you know you saw it with the Yellow Vest movement um, in, in, in France. You're seeing it across Europe. You're going to start seeing it more and more in this country as well. Um, you know, a lot of it's irrational. You know, when people were blaming Biden for high gas prices, when it was the oil industry actually refusing to drill and up production um, at a moment in oil scarcity. Um, but like that is the playbook that they're going to be able to use. And if we don't have yeah. like a, re a real one, a real policy towards this that benefits working people, not something that's on their backs, it's going to open up the door for people like Peterson to um, run interference for fossil fuel companies to continue to cook the planet at our expense. Um, as there is no doubt that the price of energy will continue to skyrocket in our lifetimes. Yeah, I mean, this is why, like the the growth stuff, um, it, it's not uh, it's not tenable. Like uh, I think compared to compared to like an all of the above rhetoric or something like that, like you got to offer abundance, and mm -hmm. uh, because they they will in their own way. Um, and even if it's a lie, it doesn't fucking matter. Um, that it was, was going to be some capitalist abundance and you know clean, whatever. Like that, it's just not. It's just not a political non-starter to be talking mm -hmm. about. You know, uh, like we need a psychic change towards mass voluntary austerity. <laughs>